Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Neville Gardner, as chair of the company. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the ninth annual general meeting of shareholders of Proteomics International Laboratories. It is now still 9.30 by my watch, and as we have a quorum of shareholders present, I declare the meeting open. The notice convening today's meeting was made available to shareholders on the 23rd of October and lodged with ASX on that date. Consequently, I will take the notice as read. Firstly, let me introduce the members of your board. In the, audium, in the auditorium today are Dr. Richard Lipsky, our Managing Director, Mr. Paul House, Non-Executive Director. Uh, online, we have uh, Dr. Robin Elliott and uh, Mr. Roger Moore. Uh, Roger's in Japan and wasn't able to be with us today. And then um, Robin suffered uh, what I'll call Qantas Force Majeure and um, had a couple of flights on her cancelled, so she was had to actually get on the red eye last night to make it back for her daughter's important wedding from the weekend. Uh, so she was with us yesterday, but couldn't be with us today. She's online. Also present here today, uh, Ms. Karen Logan, who's our company secretary, and Jessica, hiding up there, um, uh, representing BDO, our independent auditor. I would also like to welcome and acknowledge the many proteomics team members that have popped downstairs to be with us today. Richard will speak in more detail to the company's achievements in his presentation later this morning. However, I would like to take the opportunity to note that fiscal year 23 was a pivotal one for the company with the signing of the full form documentation with Sonic Healthcare USA to bring our ProMarker D test to the United States. This was followed in more recent weeks with the announcement or announcements by the US Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services for proposed reimbursement price for ProMarker D in the United States. While we were disappointed that the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration decided not to include ProMarker D in the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, we remain committed to delivering value for all our stakeholders by focusing our efforts on commercialising ProMarker D in the most relevant markets and, and advancing the very exciting pipeline of other ProMarker tests. We expect 2024 will be a year of continuing transformation of our company as the commercialization of ProMarket D in particular gains further momentum. With this in mind, your board and management are constantly evaluating the skills and experience we need in the company to deliver on the foundations now laid for future success. On behalf of the board, I would like to thank Richard and the entire proteomics team for their continuing professionalism and dedication. Their hard work has the potential to fundamentally improve millions of lives I would also like to thank all of our shareholders for their continuing support. I will now turn to the formalities of the meeting. Nice when IT works as planned. Um, so yes, uh, nice to see everybody here today and lots of familiar faces. Uh, so I'll give a formal presentation and we are recording it and we will um, put it up on, online for shareholders who couldn't be here today. As Neville said in his introduction, it has been a pivotal year for the company and we've had some really exciting developments and sometimes we forget quite how quickly things move and how fast the company is moving forward. So I'm going to um, highlight those as we go and I'll go into detail. Uh, happy to take questions along the way or um, save them for the end um, and we'll go through things as, in as much detail as we can. Uh, so a standard disclaimer uh, around forward-looking statements. As a medical technology company at the forefront of precision medicine and predictive diagnostics, we focus on three areas. Um, and this is really underpinned by our platform technology, which is proprietary to us. So we have three tests at, um, in commercialization with ProMarker D and in development with ProMarker Endo and ProMarker ESO. I'll go into these in more detail, but the starting point is that ProMarker D is now being commercialized in partnership with Sonic Healthcare in the USA. And I should, of course, say that it's a predictive test for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, again, sometimes we forget uh, what's right in front of us. We also have reimbursement pricing set for this test, which is critical to the rollout that will be coming. ProMarker Endo for endometriosis, uh, a condition which affects nine, uh, one in nine women um, in Australia and, and across the world. Uh, ex 
exciting results from a prototype where we have up to 90% of patients being identified using our simple blood tests. And esophageal cancer, um, very similar. Um, another condition which it causes, uh, uh, it's very difficult to, to treat, um, not well recognized. One in 20 cancer deaths worldwide caused by esophageal cancer. And again, in our prototype work, that we've identified up to 90% of patients with the disease. A corporate overview of where we sit. We're still a tightly held company. Um, top 40 shareholders own half the company. The directors are highly aligned with um, all of our shareholders, and uh, collectively we own 18%. We've really been focusing on institutional investors and uh, family offices in the last couple of years to try and strengthen the register in that way. And we have a good mix now of, of that, those groups on top of the um, represented by the room, some of the long-term investors that we've had um, from the retail sector. So we, we thank you for your continued support. Our state-of-the-art laboratories, if you haven't seen them, then we'll, you're welcome to have a tour afterwards and we can show you some of our, our latest um, pieces of equipment that we've installed. But it is a cutting edge facility. We have fantastic equipment. We are privileged to be able to use this kind of um, gear because it really does open doors to finding new intellectual property to creating these new diagnostic tests. And also to automating, to, to automating all of these processes is a critical part of what we do. I won't talk about our analytical services business today uh, in any detail, but it's a, also an important part. Some of the revenue from that does help offset our cash burn from the R&D and commercialization activities. And it also highly aligns with what we do. So the pharmacokinetic work is done in, done in clinical trials. And in clinical trials, people are trying to find how much drug um, is left in the person after a certain period of time. But along with that, there's a potential to come up with new biomarkers for how well the drug is working in this area of companion diagnostics I'll touch on again later. So it, our business model is, uh, is um, circular and includes these different aspects. As a company as a whole, um, this is a share price chart over the last five years, and uh, um, we're very pleased to see that development and growth. Uh, um, I've certainly seen a few charts in the last five years which go the opposite way. It's been a tough market for a few um, companies across our sector. Um, so the share price has held up well, and um, recognizing we, we've had some fantastic news and developments in the last um, year or so, and we look forward to that being reflected in, in growth in the share price in the time ahead. In terms of the cash position, uh, from our perspective, uh, approximately five million in the bank at the end of the last quarter, and another couple um, coming in from the R&D tax. So that gives us a, a clear runway to be able to do everything that I'm gonna be talking about today. We've always run a tight ship. We will continue to do so, um, but we will try to ensure that we don't miss opportunities. So we're, we're spending money where we need to, and we'll continue to push ahead with what the what the company's uh, plans are and, and the products we have in development and commercialization. I'm not going to go through the board in any detail. Um, that uh, other than say that it's a highly credentialed group of individuals, and their skill set is very important to us from the sort of M&A experience that Neville brings. Um, Rogers links into Noble Nordisk, the biggest um, one of the biggest diabetes companies in the planet, um, Paul Strategic Thinking, and, and Robin's links into, again, um, big end of, of town in the life sciences, but also links into um, the developments that uh, are going on in the sector with new drugs that are coming through, and the whole push towards interest in diabetes and kidney disease. The technology that we use to develop our intellectual property we call ProMarker. It's about identifying a molecular fingerprint that you can find in a blood sample. And those patterns that we can find, those fingerprints, they let us identify protein biomarkers that are specific to a disease. And from there, we can create our novel diagnostic tests on new intellectual property. And the tests that um, we've been Really excited to see the developments on in the last couple of years with Promarker D. It is going to change the lives of people around the world with diabetes as we bring it through. It's a predictive test. This is the key point that we can proactively intervene and change renal healthcare. 
It's also a simple blood test, which is a key point to note. Why do we work on diabetes? We all know diabetes is a growing problem, um, literally. Uh, so 537 million people worldwide today with diabetes. What we frequently are not aware of, or certainly people that I talk to, is that one in three people with diabetes already have kidney disease. The reason that that's such a, a high number is because the disease is a silent killer. You can lose 80% of your kidney function and you wouldn't know. You might start to feel a bit lethargic. On top of that, the existing tests simply aren't very good at, at picking up the disease. So the current standard of care is a bit of a roadblock for picking up the disease. And um, known as EGFR, um, as many glomerular filtration rate, simple blood test, ACR, album credit ratio, a simple urine test, they've both been around for about 50 years and they're simply not able to diagnose accurately and they certainly can't predict the onset of the disease. And if you can't pick up the disease, then the problem with your kidneys is that um, the damage that occurs is irreversible. And so you'll be on an inevitable path towards dialysis and kidney transplant. It's also important to point out that your kidneys are the body's filter system. And if they don't work properly, then you're going to get a whole range of other diseases. And a simple analogy is we all have all seen what happens to the swimming pool if the filter turns off for a few days, particularly at this sort of time of year, and the bacteria and the bugs that will grow in that as a consequence. Well, your kidneys are pro providing the same kind of filter system. And if they don't work, then you'll be susceptible to a whole range of diseases and you will die younger. We have the opportunity with ProMarketD to provide a solution that we can intervene and slow or stop the onset of diabetic kidney disease before any clinical symptoms appear. So that's what we've been able to show. We can pick up the disease up to four years in advance. And what we have been excited to see recently and what we will talk about as, as I go through is the new drugs that are coming through because there are now cures for diabetic kidney disease. Uh, and they are going to, in combination with our tests, potentially sell healthcare systems billions of dollars and certainly improve the quality of life for patients. We have a world-class advisory board that we've put in place at ProMarketD. I'm not going to go through their CVs because that would be a very long exercise. Even the summaries are, are very impressive. What I wanted to show here is that we've got people from around the world. Um, we've got these key opinion leaders in Australia who are really bought into what we're doing here. We've been working hard to sign up and to engage with key opinion leaders around the world and from Europe and particularly in the US, we have a fantastic team from specialists in the nephrology sector through to nurse practitioners. They're all highly credentialed. They're well connected into the American Diabetes Association and equivalent bodies. And they are all advocates for what this test could do. They're not on board to promote the test. They're on board to critique the test, to, crit to, crit to critique and understand the need for better testing and better treatments in diabetic kidney disease. And they all want to work with us. They were all looking at the data that we've got. They, they are our best critiques, as I said, but they're also potentially our best advocates as we get them to understand what the test can do and where this is going to, to take us. So ProMarketD itself is a simple um, to use to test and to integrate into standard practice. So we've designed it to fit with the existing healthcare processes. So a blood sample that would be drawn for any patient with diabetes. And I should say at the start, if you've got diabetes, then you'll be tested every couple of years under standard of care. And so that blood sample can then uh, be taken to the laboratory and we've engineered our test onto a simple immunoassay platform and that measures three protein biomarkers and we combine that with some very simple clinical factors, the EGFR test that I mentioned, your cholesterol and your age. So that data was already be known for any patient with diabetes. The test is CMR registered in Europe and we're currently manufacturing um, to a particular standard called ISO 13485. So that's a global standard for manufacturing, that's critical. And I, I will acknowledge our team, there's been a lot of hard work to get the test um, up to that standard and working with our, our partners in Europe to produce the test. And, and I won't go into more detail on that here, but we do have a, a good inventory of, of tests now in stock that we can use um, for the, um, um, the potential use that's coming along. Those results can be uploaded into the, um, from the, from the lab can be uploaded into our ProMarketD hub. And from there, 
an algorithm calculates the risk score for the patients and we categorize patients as um, low, medium, or high risk. And that's when we can then choose a therapeutic or the medical intervention that's gonna follow, potentially change of lifestyle or these new classes of drug that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail shortly. This is intended to just give a bit more clarity to how the test works so that when I'm talking about risk categories, we can understand where it sits. So in, in, this is a simple representation of what one of our test reports would look like. And the key point here is we're testing a patient with diabetes and they have no existing kidney disease. So they're consider, they would consider, be considered to be at low risk for treatment interventions. By using Promarker D, we can then measure their risk for developing diabetic kidney disease in the next four years. And so of a patient group, the majority will, will sit in that low risk group, some will sit in the moderate risk, and some will sit in the high risk. If you're in the high risk group in our test, then that's a strong indication that you're gonna be developing diabetic kidney disease in the next four years, and we need to intervene. On the contrary, if you're in the low risk group, we have a 98% rule out rate, meaning if you're sitting there, the odds of you developing a complication are very small. And so you, we don't need to do aggressive treatments. And this is important for looking at how healthcare systems can manage the use of the tests and generate benefit at both ends. So obviously if I'm a pharmaceutical company, I would love everybody to take my drug. And if it's got any potential benefit, then I'll say, well, everybody should. But our data shows that that's not necessary. And not everybody with diabetes needs to take these um, expensive drugs that may provide benefit down the track, but they're simply not necessary yet. In the red zone, it's completely the opposite no existing risk categories, but apart from our pro D score, and then these patients do need to go on the drug early. And we have strong clinical evidence to support the benefit of going on to drug early and that these drugs will decrease risk scores. This will be a recurring test. So for those high risk patients, we would test frequently, potentially every three to six months. For the low risk patients, annually, once to, one, or two, um, once, one or two years, depending on the individual. So this is some of the data that I was starting to allude to and why we're able to talk about this test as a game changer for the uh, diabetes population globally. So we've tested ProMarketE in 5,000 patients across the world in long-term clinical studies and a number of publications that we've put out. One in particular with Janssen, um, that's the pharmaceutical arm of Johnson & Johnson, a long-term clinical study that they were running up for a clinical trial on one of their drugs. So we looked at this retrospectively and we were able to work out which patients had, or sorry, would go on to develop um, kidney disease three or four years down the track. And our segregation between the high risk and the low risk was very good. Um, that's a decent P value for those of you who know a bit about statistics. The key point is that we can identify patients in that red group on that test and if those patients go on to drug early, the pro D risk score drops. So what we're seeing in that little graph at the bottom is that those on placebo, their risk score continues to go up if you, between the beginning of the trial and the end of the trial. But if you went on drug, your risk score went down. So these patients weren't sick. We predicted that they would get sick. They went on drug, and the chances of them getting sick decreased. In another part of the trial, we showed that those who that we did predict were going to get sick, they went on to get sick if they weren't on drug. In parallel with this, we have great position support. I was talking about our advisory board. As an example, uh, some of them um, do come out of the, these sort of detailed survey-based uh, um, studies that we can do, where we engage with uh, an independent body to contact a large panel of endocrinologists and specialists, uh, as well as primary care physicians across the US. And then um, in the final result, we, we, we have a survey of 400 um, individuals, and 96% of those physicians indicated that they would use the ProMarket e scores to help their clinical decision making. So that says that they want to test, they want to do more than they're currently doing for their patients that there's a real need and demand for tests like ProMarker D. There are obviously other tests that they could use. They could measure cholesterol, they could use the existing tests. 
we offered a whole panel of, of options for the positions, but they always came back and said, well, Pro Market E was one or, ranked one or two in their decision making in terms of how often should I see my patient, whether I should give them anti-inflammatories, which potentially um, renal damaging, or using these drugs, the SGLD2s um, are particular class of drugs for um, managing diabetes, but these are the ones that are being now shown to be renal protective. And ACE inhibitors are another um, drug for diabetes. Again, our tests can help guide the use of a drug like that, which again, potentially has some negative benefits uh, um, or negative effects if used excessively in the wrong patients. And the other point to mention, as I said at the beginning, if we compare ProMarker D to standard of care, uh, standard of care doesn't work. So on that right-hand side, we looked at a panel of, of patients, um, community-based people with diabetes, and studied them for a long period of time. And I should say the good news is for most people with diabetes, uh, they won't develop kidney disease quickly. But, so you do have a bit of time. But roughly 10% of patients will. ProMarket E was able to pick those up eight or nine times out of 10, whereas existing standard care can't pick up any. So that's the point of difference for our tests. Having said um, that there's a good position for people with diabetes, meaning that we'll only develop kidney disease slowly, over time, most patients with diabetes will de eventually develop kidney disease. So we're always going to have people to test because there's a constant funnel of people with pre-diabetes getting diabetes who will then develop kidney disease. As I said, one in three already have kidney disease. And unfortunately, it's people in that group will die younger. And so there's a, a funnel. And what we're trying to do is to slow that funnel down so that we can test people earlier so that in future, perhaps, there's not 10% of people with kidney decline. And there's not one in three diabetes patients with chronic kidney disease. Uh, so a couple of things here that we wanted to, to introduce and, and talk to, and it, um, they're really key to understanding the benefit of ProMarker D, and these are some of the key developments this year that make a difference for Proteomics International as a company and the product that we're seeking to bring to market. The first is the need. Um, countries across the globe, healthcare systems across the globe, are really starting to shout about the problem with kidney disease. We were fortunate to be introduced to Kidney Research UK and were able to assist them uh, into sponsoring some of their work that they were doing to look at the problem with kidney disease. And their report that they published in the middle of the year was de declaring that kidney disease is a public health emergency in the UK, that it's going to cost the UK economy um, potentially $14 billion, uh, um, potentially more, um, Probably they don't have enough money to spend on it. Um, but the and the point is that it's these are billions of dollars that, that are being spent on kidney disease. And the same message really with the uh, Kidney Health Australia. Um, we're looking at $10 billion currently um, on the cost of kidney disease. All of them are saying that early intervention will save billions of dollars because we, we have to look after the patients better. We also have some of our own data along these lines, and we were able to present some of our work at the um, American Society for Nephrology uh, in Philadelphia um, just last month. And again, it substantiates this message that kidney disease is expensive. If you can intervene and do something about it, you're going to make a difference for those patients, and therefore you will save money because you, uh, if you can keep people in the higher categories of risk, so, sorry, the earlier categories, um, of lower risk, so they're in that green zone for longer, the medical costs associated with that are greatly reduced um, compared to once they drop into later stage kidney disease. That's where the, the point of difference is. That's where you're going to save money. And the, these treatments that are now coming through are the game changers for the patients. So this is, I said, the simple message, if you were in the, the orange zone or the red zone, and when we started this work, the best that we could um, stay back to our, our um, or the, the physicians that we work with could say back to their patients is you need to live a better lifestyle. But most people um, know that already. I'm sure you'll sit on the couch more than you should do. You'll all have the, um, the beer and the crisps. Well, some of you might be a bit more healthy than, than I am. But uh, and the point is that we don't lead the healthy lifestyles that we should. Um, but a, a bigger stick 
waved at you to say, well, you're going to actually be on a path to dialysis in a few years' time would probably make a few of us get off the couch a bit more often. So that's one benefit. But these new renal protective therapies are the game changers. So the SGLD2 inhibitors, and there's a broad family of them now, they're, they're all billion dollar drugs, already used widely for diabetes. In the last couple of years, they've now each been indicated for diabetic kidney disease. So camagliflozin is the one that we were working on with Janssen, and we've got empagliflozin and dapagliflozin from um, Lilly, Boehringer, AstraZeneca. Those drugs will all benefit patients in late stage kidney disease. What our data shows is that they would also benefit patients in early stage diabetes to stop them developing kidney disease. And so that area becomes known as companion diagnostics, and that's uh, our companion and complementary diagnostics, and that's where we see the benefits. Of note, the GLP-1 agonist, semaglutide, um, which has certainly got a bit of excitement um, in the, um, shall we say, the, um, some of the investor channels which are less focused on the, on the, uh, on the science, at early days, but as MPIG has got potential to be renal protective based on the trial that was stopped early. We don't know how good it will be yet, but it's potentially a drug that could fall in the same stable as SGLD2 inhibitors and benefit patients by using it early. So that's where we sit with Promarker D. On the right-hand side, the potential for using our tests to help inform doctors' treatment decisions. As I've been saying, high-risk patients go on the drug early, that will be renal protective. Low-risk patients don't need to go on the drug yet. Azempic and, uh, and the uh, DAPA embagliflozin, canagliflozin, they're all very expensive drugs, potentially $1,000 a month type treatments. If you don't need to be on them and you can go on a much lower grade, uh, lower cost diabetes drug, then it's going to be beneficial for the healthcare system. You also don't want to go on these um, high-end drugs too soon because they the benefit will always decrease over time. So the later you can start, the better it's going to be for your long-term health. The other key aspect of being a complementary diagnostic is that you can monitor dosage. So with a test like Promarker D, the patients who are then given one of these drugs, we can see if it starts to benefit the patient. If it is, then great. If it's not, then the doctors have the opportunity to change dosage and increase dosage to see if that provides benefit. If that's not working, then they can switch patients to a different drug. So Promarker D is a monitoring tool for patients in this group is the key. And that's what that previous survey that I um, spoke about really emphasized. And the, the key point to also note is that all of this is occurring before the onset of diabetic kidney disease at all. So this is the adage of prevention is better than cure. On the intellectual property side and the commercial side, as I said, diabetes affects a very large number of people around the world. We have a heavily, um, heavy bias towards the Western markets in terms of our, our targets. On the left-hand side, the blue charts show the number of people in each of those jurisdictions with uh, diabetes. I should say um, our test is uh, patented in all all the global jurisdictions and heavily um, protected uh, and, and we have a range of other mechanisms to, to look after our, our know-how, uh, including the, um, the algorithm being uh, and confidential. But if we look at the US, 32 million people there with diabetes. So that becomes our target population for testing. And as I said, it's a test that's likely to be performed um, once a year on average per patient. And if we look at a royalty rate, in the 5 to 15% range, and that's an indication of what we would expect for a, a test like ours. Um, and the model that we use is to out-license. And this is why um, Neville and I are describing this is a pivotal year, because the license that we've signed with Sonic Healthcare USA for exclusive use of ProMarket in the U in the US, the world's largest healthcare market, is the best way for us to roll out a test like Promarker D. Sonic Healthcare have the infrastructure, they have the know-how, 
they have the sales reps, they've got the pathologists, they already have a substantial market share and they're hungry, they're trying to grow it. So they're the third largest diagnostics uh, um, laboratory in the US and they're actively growing, actively trying to grow that market share. A test like ProMarketE gives them a point of difference to grow that market share. ProMarketE test has been listed on the um, Sonic Healthcare US website um, since the middle of the year, emphasizing the importance. It's, the, it's on their homepage. It's their test um, that they're seeking to develop and bring to market. But we're working um, proactively and have been working proactively with them for the last several months to ensure that we are able to run the test, that we can market the test, that all the processes are in place. Sonic reference laboratories in a um, number of sites across the US. We deal with the primary one in, in Texas. They are known as CLIA certified, so that's a key point. That is the badge that they have to have to be able to run the test. And by working with that laboratory, with their network, then we can provide the test to patients across the US. A key point in being able to provide that test is reimbursement. And in the last um, year, we've, we've made enormous steps forward on that. And I can't emphasize how critical reimbursement is. Uh, we'd all like to, uh, well, if we're morally, uh, have a moral compass, we'd all like to think that regulatory and, and uh, getting the test to people matters. Um, reality in the US is if you don't, if somebody's not paying for it, then we're probably not going to get access to it. And, and so reimbursement's the key in the US. And Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, they cover 42% of the US healthcare system. So Medicare covers the over 65s, Medicaid covers the lower income earners. So that's representing almost 100 million people across the US. We secured a PLA code, as it's known. So that's a specific laboratory code that identifies the ProMarketE test so that we can then provide it through um, to patients and it can be tracked through the whole process. So the code was the first point that, um, in this journey um, back in January, working closely with um, Sonic and um, US and, and our team. As we announced yesterday, we have a final pricing determination of $390 and 75 cents, I know for one or two people, 75 cents extra can all make a difference as well, um, particularly our, our, our marketing commercial people. Um, as I pointed out, if we're selling a million tests, then 75 cents does matter. Um, $390 US, as I indicated, um, we would expect to be seeing a royalty on every test that's sold. So for simple calculations, if we took the middle of our range of five to 15% and said 10%, then it's a $40 royalty US on every test that is sold. And um, that pricing becomes effective at the beginning of January next year. And at that point, all the ducks are in alignment so that Sonic is in a position where it can roll out the test and readily can collect revenue from patients that it's offering it to. So the incentive for our partner to bring this test to market is increased um, substantially. We've previously given indications that the test price could be um, lower than this, so um, great outcome for all. And um, we still consider a very affordable test. And compared to some of our partners, um, uh, sorry, not our partners, compared to some of our competitors, this is a very sensible price that's affordable. Um, and, and we see us ourselves being able to penetrate the market now. How quickly can we penetrate the U.S. market? We don't know. What are our sales going to look like? We don't know. We're currently not selling any tests in the U.S. Um, and there's um, limited um, opportunity for patients to, to get access to any any test like ProMarketE. If we come back to numbers, the US, as I said, has got 32 million people with diabetes. About 20 million of them know. And as I said on the last slide, Sonic have about 10% of the market. So that means they're already seeing 2 million people with diabetes on a regular basis that they'll be testing for existing diabetes tests every year or two. So that's the immediately addressable market that we can seek to target with ProMarketE e to the point we go live. How quickly we can penetrate that 10 million people, we don't know. But that's obviously the low-hanging fruit, and that's what we're working towards. Stage two will be the other 18 million people that we're not seeing through Sonic. 
but that's Sonic's point of difference, that they have a test now that could make a difference for that 18 million people and get access to that. Um, so um, we look forward at some point to getting our first test sold and then to our first million tests sold. And the revenue from, um, from that point would obviously um, be transformational. How quickly we can get there, we do not know. But there's definitely no guidance in that sentence. Other markets, I won't go into um, too much detail here, um, other than to say the UK is an exciting market opportunity for us and one that we have made good progress in over the, the last year. Um, we are working with our partner there, Apicor, who are a distributor, so it's a different model, and I'll talk more to that in a second. Um, but the National Institute for Care, excellent, nice, they manage new products coming through on behalf of the National Health Service. And they published nice advice, a, a briefing note on the ProMarket e-test at the um, December of last year, indicating the benefit of a test like ProMarket e to patients. It is a long process to get the ProMarket e onto um, supply chain, uh, NHS supply chain registers and getting it into guidelines. We continue to work with our partner in the UK on this, and I should say, um, the, the KOLs that we um, that we've engaged with in the UK have been proactive. With um, our teams just returned from a um, a major event for the diabetes care professionals in in London, uh, where we had um, one of our key opinion leaders there, Professor Davis, as, as well as um, a couple of our um, commercial team and a number of representatives from Apicor, running panels to discuss the importance of better testing in diabetes for kidney disease. And we've done a number of these. I'm just talking about one in, in London now. We've run one in, in Australia, and we've run other events. People are literally out the door from um, the reports like I'm getting back, queuing out the door to get into these rooms because they are all recognizing that this sort of test is needed. And so it's really a um, powerful endorsement of the benefit of bringing this test forward and this route to market, meaning talking through key opinion leaders into their peers, is the way of getting awareness. And we see that as the best long-term route to bringing these patients, um, bringing the test through to these patients. Um, Puerto Rico and, and Dominican Republic, we mentioned because that was an early test market for us, a way of fine-tuning some of our processes and ensuring that the um, the test did what it said on the on the packet. Um, so that's gone well, uh, um, still early stages with the, the rollout there, but and we are um, getting sales through those markets and looking at what we might be able to do in other neighboring territories through South America and Central America. Um, Europe will be the next um, target for us um, following the US. As I said earlier, we have team up registration so we can provide the test there more readily the route to market does depend on um, the type of partner that we find. So obviously with Sonic, it's a license, they can run the test. With other groups, it will be distributor license, we provide the test of the distributor, they will on sell it to laboratories. Different models, different markets, we look for which ones work best in those markets and are able to give us the best penetration. So we will continue to, to see what doors um, open and we look forward to providing updates around Europe in the near to medium term. The rest of the world as well on the back of talk, uh, making announcements around working with Sonic US and um, some of the results that we've announced around the benefit of um, our test on people with drugs uh, taking some of these new drugs. We do get significant inbound inquiries and that, that continues to um, present opportunities for us and our team works to explore those and, and uh, see what we can do elsewhere as soon as possible. In terms of our pipeline, it's rich. Um, uh, we've got some fantastic products coming through. We're always seeking to target areas of a significant unmet medical need. And by that we mean, are they going to affect a lot of people or the existing tests simply aren't good enough? So that's our objective. Following ProMarket E, we have um, Endo and ESO, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, very similar 
process to um, the Promark ID development and commercialization. Uh, OxyDX is a, a different type of product. I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. We have other tests in the pipeline for asthma, um, looking at um, Giardia. Um, it's a broad technology platform that we have that lets us look at these fingerprints in a range of systems, so it can even affect things like plant dieback and the other complications of diabetes that we're also exploring. Uh, so we're, we're conscious of not spreading ourselves too thin, and some of these programs are uh, deliberately set on the back burner compared to the ones that we have so that we can bring um, Endo and ESO forward in the footsteps of ProMarketE more quickly. Endometriosis, um, this is a, a fantastic opportunity to transform a large number of lives around the world. If you don't know what endometriosis is, then, as I like to say to the gentlemen in the room, talk to your sisters or your mothers, and, and then they will, they will be able to tell you a lot more about it. Um, it's a condition where tissue grows out of the uterus into other organs, and it can be an extremely painful condition. Unfortunately, it's frequently confused with period pain. That's not good. Okay. Temporary glitch, we're back. Um, so as I said, frequently confused with period pain. Currently only diagnosed with invasive surgery, laparoscopy and incision through the abdomen um, to take uh, either with a camera to have a look to see whether there's something growing where it shouldn't be and then potentially to take a biopsy and go and screen for that. It affects one in nine women around the world, costs $10 billion a year in Australia. Um, that's just Australia. So this is a global problem. We have potentially a world first test, a simple blood test that could identify women who have the disease and then we can intervene. Just on the technical side, we'll, we have a, an important collaboration with the Royal, Royal Women's Hospital and the University of Melbourne. Uh, the study that we've done is on 900 patients. That's a good sized study for this type of work. We've presented this data um, at World Endometriosis Conference in the middle of the year, very well received. As we said, potentially pivotal findings that we can identify endometriosis with a simple blood test. We do need to do additional work to look in other patient cohorts to be able to substantiate the results that we've got. The reason that this condition is difficult to work on and why we think we can make a difference is because most of the time doctors are unwilling to actually perform a laparoscopy in the first place because the risks of doing that can potentially create a lot more problems for that individual as a consequence of sticking a camera in and poking around. It's, it's not without risk. So that's why people do not currently get ready access to a laparoscopy. What we are hoping with our test that we will be able to do is to provide a strong level of confidence for the treating physician to say, yes, this woman has a high chance of having, high likelihood of having endometriosis, now we will go in and have a look. Or no, there is no indication that this woman has endometriosis, we should not go and have a look, we'll see if there's something else that we can um, look for to understand the, the pain that they might be in. Another area that's very important to recognize the opportunity here is in fertility. Um, IVF clinics, the data suggests that there's a much greater um, preponderance of endometriosis in women attending infertility clinics. One in nine in the community, one in three um, for women attending infertility clinics. So that's saying that um, there will be people who are going to the clinics. They, they may not have any symptoms, um, but the endometriosis is still there and it's affecting their ability to get pregnant. We potentially can use a test to help screen and the scenario would be, well, if you do have a high likelihood of endometriosis based on our test, then we need to deal with that first before you start rounds of IVF treatment. And that's uh, that sort of opportunity is being explored by um, others in the in the world trying to bring through tests. There are no current um, co 
currently proven tests for endometriosis worldwide. There's um, one or two in early stage development like ours. Um, no simple blood tests. We look forward to seeing what we can do with endometriosis over the next um, six months. Um, I should emphasize the key is getting samples and attending the World Endometriosis Conference was um, a door opener to those conversations and we'll provide updates on that um, in the months ahead. Esophageal cancer, same um, type of concept. We are trying to develop a simple blood test. We have developed a prototype simple blood test for patients with this condition. Esophageal cancer is a nasty cancer. Um, picked up currently by sticking a tube down your esophagus and taking a biopsy, uh, normally done under anesthetic. Um, painful, costly. Uh, if you're in a risk category, meaning if you have acid reflux, um, you're in a risk category of the pre-cancerous stage is called Barrett's esophagus, and that can lead to esophageal adenic carcinoma. If you develop cancer, this cancer, your five-year survival rate is less than 20%. So it, it's one you want to get early and it's one that is currently being missed a lot, which is why um, for a relatively uncommon cancer, as it was, it um, has a greater death rate than, than a number of others. Uh, so we, we do have good treatments for um, a number of cancers across the world now, which is a fantastic um, advance with immunotherapies. There are not the equivalent treatments available for esophageal cancer. Um, we've just been at a, a, a conference um, with this Australian surgical um, group, and we were invited to, to talk about our test there. The surgeons want a test like this because they do like cutting people open, but they want to do it in a way where they can get the benefit. And what we have learned by talking with them is that there is, with the different grades of esophageal uh, adenocarcinoma, um, if you're in grade stage one, um, then they can do something about it. They can cut it out and your survival rate will be good compared to if you're in stage two, three or four, you are not going to be living for very long. So we have the potential here, again, to screen these patients, to identify which ones are at risk and then do something about it earlier. Again, a prototype test, a prototype blood test, identify 90% of people with the disease, um, working with a uh, core group out of the and QMI Berghofer in Queensland, uh, 300 um, samples across a couple of studies. Again, we need to study more patients in, in different cohorts. Um, I was um, privileged to attend the World Esophageal Diseases Conference in uh, Toronto um, only in September, and the interest in what we were doing was extremely high. I didn't enjoy some of the pictures over my breakfast in terms of what they do, but the Interest in providing cohorts for us to go and analyze um, was, um, I was astonished. It was, um, I would describe it as a million dollar meeting in terms of some of the contacts that we made and being able to get access to cohorts. So we're currently in conversation around a number of groups globally um, on top of what we already have from the Victoria Biobank, which we secured and announced um, a few months ago. With all of these pieces of work, it's about proving the, the data that we generate from an Australian cohort, we can then generate in an independent cohort somewhere else in the world. The more we do that, the more everybody else will be on board and we can roll the test out faster. Changing tack slightly, um, oxidative stress. This is a test that we haven't spoken about um, previously in any detail. Uh, um, we did put some more information on our annual report, so I encourage you to have a look at that if you haven't read it already. But oxidative stress is a, um, it's a very understated or unrecognized condition. Um, we all know about stress, um, but oxidative stress, poor lifestyle, overtraining, um, implicate, this condition is implicated in over 70 um, conditions. Uh, it's almost a component of all health conditions. We span out a company called OxidX in partnership with the University of Western Australia. Um, and we spun out this company last year. The technology underpinning OxidX, and we've been incubating um, for um, several years. 
it's a, what we potentially have though here is a very simple test that can measure health and well-being, muscle damage, the state of the state of the body. Why does that matter? Um, we developed this work, sorry, we developed this test by working on some really significant clinical conditions, muscular dystrophy uh, in particular. That's a muscle wasting um, test and we have a large number of publications um, with our uh, science team and our, our university collaborators showing that this test can really identify this sort of muscle damage. And what we've been able to determine and what we're now working through is the applications for how can we just use that same test to pick up early stages of muscle damage. So there's broad applications potentially um, for monitoring competition preparedness from athletes um, through to horses. Um, some would say that you need it more in horses because you can't communicate with them, but then some would actually say high performance athletes probably don't quite tell you what's going on either. Um, the point is high number of um, sports injuries or damages to uh, damage can occur through muscle, um, you know, the muscle related and we're not picking these up soon enough. We're not looking at the right time. Obviously the horse can't tell you that it's, um, it feels like it's been overtrained. The high performance athlete won't tell you that, that they've been overtraining because they want to play on the weekend. Um, the amateur athlete probably wants to overtrain because they've been working on it for three months and they want to do the marathon and they don't want to miss out. But our tests like ours can potentially say, well, if you do that, then you're going to create, you're going to cause some damage. Um, we've also got applications in the more um, broad area of, of health and well-being, um, both for uh, people as well as livestock, and monitoring um, the the, the uh, um, oxidative stress that the conditions under which uh, a sheep may be sitting in a pen or a, a fish may be sitting in a fish tank to see if it's being well looked after uh, and is thriving is a, our application to our test. So we're doing a, a number of small studies at the moment to, to validate the use of the test, particularly in the, um, athletes and, and the horse racing. And we look forward to being able to talk about those in the, um, towards the middle of next year. You'll be pleased to know I'm getting towards the end now, so um, uh, your cup of tea is not too far off. The chart here, um, really emphasizing what we've been working on through the um, 2023 financial year, and then what we set ourselves as targets for the 2024 financial year. Uh, so m many of the things that are on here, I've already um, spoken to, but I, I put a yellow box around it, it's because it's a significant um, milestone over and above what are a whole range of significant milestones for us. Um, start to emphasize the UK um, publishing its nice advice is a strong step forward to getting Promarket E into market with the National Health Service. Getting the reimbursement code for Promarket E in the US was the first step towards getting Promarket E rolled out in the US. Demonstrating that SGLD2 inhibitors benefit the high-risk patients that we're identifying is a game changer for those patients. And it's the first set of data anywhere that shows that our whole prevention is better than cure model works. Obviously, an announcing the partnership with Sonic Healthcare is a uh, pivotal step forward for us as a company. And uh, the, the data around the World Endometriosis Conference and, uh, and stepping into financial year 2024, the World Esophageal Cancer Conference is um, key. I will emphasize our patent position our, um, always matters. And the protection um, that we've, we've secured for OxyDX in Japan is part of a new suite of um, payments coming through, which will give long term protection to that test as we bring it, as we seek to bring it to market. And, Obviously, the uh, reimbursement pricing, as I've um, spoken about, is what makes a difference for, for bringing the test through. So what we look forward to and what we set ourselves a target for this financial year, yes, we all want to generate revenue from ProMarketE. That is our key focus at the moment. Um, we look forward to talking about other licensing deals with ProMarketE around the world and uh, further updates on our ProMarket pipeline. So I'll... I'll Finish with talking about the value inflection points as we see them. I've touched on each of those 
um, area from first sales and, and pricing um, and licensing in other parts of the world. So th these are our, our estimates for when we're going to have news in these different areas. Um, we'll provide updates as we can uh, um, in terms of partnering, getting access to cohorts in the pro market pipeline, getting that next set of data. Um, I should say for both endometriosis and esophageal cancer, we consider that those two tests are both one independent study away from us being confident in saying the test is going to do what we think it is doing meaning confirming that we're going to that level of accuracy that it will be a clinically usable test uh, so for both of those opportunities it's going to be an exciting time in the first half of next year and then i'll finish with the box on the left in terms of where we sit as a company and why we are different so we do have an in-house diagnostics platform which is disruptive and it's cutting edge. Uh, there are very few groups around the world able to do what we're able and what we can do here. Um, one of um, our, our um, competitor proteomics companies, a um, company called Olink, was just taken out for three to four billion dollars um, as a um, by a thermo. They're a platform company, and they're able to find markets for others. Uh, we do that as part of our bread and butter. Pro-market e-test is de-risk, painted, revenue ready. And it's setting the scene for what's going to come. So this test is rolling out. It's easy to use. It's scalable. It's a low-cost test with high margins. Uh, so we look forward to making um, Sonic um, um, an even richer company. And we look forward to making our shareholders um, um, much richer as well as we try and um, get this test um, to the patients that, we, that will need it. The, the potential to partner for ProMarketE is vast um, in terms of pharma companies as well as diagnostics labs, uh, and we will continue to talk about um, those partnerships as we um, develop them. I wanted to emphasize that ProMarketE, we consider this to be the first test in, in the pipeline, and the others will follow in the footsteps towards commercialization in the um, years ahead. And we do think it's a fantastic sector to be working in. It's obviously very vibrant with a um, Developments that have been going on in precision medicine. Um, I just mentioned that sort of takeover um, at the start of this slide. A uh, lot of interest in the uh, pharmacokinetic space, a um, lot of interest in complementary diagnostics, a lot of interest in precision medicine, a lot of interest in developing new drugs for diabetic kidney disease. Big pharma companies are investing a lot of money in this space. We play across all of it, and we think we're nicely positioned in the middle of it. Um, so we, we look forward to exciting times for our company in 2024 and beyond. Thank you very much. Any questions? One second. Uh, we're just going to... For the recordings, we'll just give you a microphone so that others can hear. Yeah, thank you, Richard. That was a that was a good presentation. You covered off on a few points that I was was interested in. Um, one of the bits that I was interested in as well on, uh, I know that uh, you did the study with Janssen um, uh, and looked at the SGLT2. Um, uh, I guess benefits that would go with the, the tenagliflozin. How have you pronounced that one? Um, are you going to be doing anything similar with Ozempic at all? We believe that there's a great opportunity for us to show what ProMarket E can do with other drugs. And our objective is to get access to some of the clinical trials that have been run for other drugs. And with the hypothesis that ProMarket E will behave the same way. So we would like to get access to, to completed trials like that. And we're working through our networks to do that. Whether um, that's possible, or we, we can't say at this stage. Right. Thanks for that. Um, the only other one which I think is fairly significant on my list is uh, to do with uh, IP um, and IP theft that's been in the paper a lot lately. Um, and it's also one of the areas that the government, I think, is putting some money into, uh, particularly small businesses with regards to losing stuff. Um, the uh, Mike Burgess was uh, was worried about the uh, companies losing uh, huge amounts of data um, to uh, un unnamed foreign entities. Um, 
has the business come under attack? Are there counter surveillance uh, or you know, systems to, de to detect theft? Um, and uh, what else is being done to protect the very valuable IP of uh, PIQ? So, no, we haven't come under attack. Um, yes, we're very conscious of that issue, and some of our board members are extremely diligent and nagging about that issue. So it's not um, not escaped us as an area to focus on. Um, we do run simulations. We, we do get outside um, consultants to, to effectively try and hack our system and, and see um, what happens next. So um, we believe that we, we've put in the necessary safeguards. We continue to monitor um, what is going on. Um, but um, we're, we're in the fortunate position that we do have um, very strong firewalls for what we're doing. Uh, and, and we think that that's manageable as best we know today. Thank you. Other questions? Very good. Thank you very much. Um, to, as I said, if you, anybody would like a tour through um, past as well as um, um, new faces, if you want to see where things sit today, you're welcome to have a look through the labs. Um, just uh, um, Catherine, if you put your hand up, um, so so Catherine can organise that for you. Um, otherwise, you're welcome to stay and join us for a cup of tea. And thank you again for your attendance.